Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Phoenix Wisdom Podcast. My name is Janet Sandberg. I am your host, and today we have Cheryl Stoltz with us. Welcome, Cheryl. Thank you, Janet. It really is such an honor to be here. I am so glad that you're here, and I am excited to hear your story. I always get a little bit of you know, being able to to meet you beforehand, I see what the end result is. So I'm always very excited to learn the stories about, you know, where where you started from. But before we get there, just tell us a little bit about yourself, a little introduction. I'm a spiritual coach, master healer, and I help women who know they have blocks and they they really lack clarity. They just want that clarity and they know they're meant for more. They know they want to They want to pivot. They want big change in their lives, desperate for change, Mm -hmm. and are really willing to open themselves up and do the work. Awesome. Yeah. And and I'm guessing you you know something about doing the work. Oh, boy. 30 (laughs) years of it. 30 years of it. Yeah. All right. Let's go back in time a little bit and tell us what what was going on in your life when you were having suicidal ideations and you know, considering not being here. Well, I'm going to say something I've never, ever said publicly and will likely never say again. Um, and I, I, uh, I will say that when I was 14, I attempted suicide okay. and woke up very angry that I didn't do it right. Oh, very, very angry. Never told a soul until I was tipsy one night and told my sister-in-law and brother when I was 28. Wow. Yeah. So that's another 14 years after it happened. Oh my gosh. And you just carried that around with you. Just carried it around with me. All by yourself. All by myself. As you were trying to grow up and, and become an adult. So what, what brought on the attempt? Five dollars. A missing $5 bill at my friend's house. And my friend's mother called. There were four of us that hung out together all the time. And you know, when you're 14, your friends are the most important Mm -hmm. people on earth. I remember my family becoming not so important. You know, family (laughs) gatherings. I would go and everything. But I just wanted to be with my friends. So I had these close friends. And we were over at one friend's house. And apparently there was a $5 bill, which back then was a lot more than it is today. There was yes. a $5 bill sitting on the coffee table. And when her mom got home, it was missing. And we were, it was one of us who was blamed. So her mom called each of us and the other girls started crying when they were accused. And I didn't, I just said, well, I didn't take the money. You know, I, I babysit, mm-hmm. you know, I have money and I didn't start crying. So she thought it was me. So my friends all turned against me. (gasps) My friends all turned against me. So I was sitting in my room crying for like an hour and a half. Yeah. And then my parents were going out and my mom came in and she knew I was crying. And then she just told me to stop crying and they left. And that I, I was just, and so, uh, it didn't work. I woke up and yet what I want to say is that suicide somewhat runs in my family. My uncle uh, later took his life. My second youngest brother took his life. Oh, I'm so at the sorry. Age of yeah, actually, he was. Yeah, he was. He was thirty, and uh, it it's. Uh, and then historically, you know, there there are others, and so even after that, I did have suicidal ideation when I was married to my first husband, and I I remember distinctly. One time I almost, I was really going to drive my car over a cliff. I thought I can't do it well with pills. And so it just tells you I was really troubled. Yeah. There there was a lot going on in here, suffered from depression, depression and suicide go hand in hand. And I I later learned, actually not all that long ago, that everyone who is suicidal has one feeling in common. They feel alone. Yes. They feel alone very, very alone. And so I was, I was feeling pretty alone. Yeah. Well, of course, I mean, you're 14, all of your friends abandoned you and then you were really upset about that. And then your parents abandoned you. I just 
for the evening, but you know, when you're, when you're 14 and you know, your emotions are ginormous, that, that was all it took. Yeah. 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 And so now I, you know, the, one of the most important things of my, in my life right now is connection. Mm -hmm. It's, it's likely the most fulfilling work that I do is to connect with others at the deepest levels and help them release those feelings. I just worked with a man today, just not long before this podcast, and he went back, second time he went back to this place of feeling alone at the age of four. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I helped him, we, we work in the subconscious, and what can we do about that? And we really can reprogram, reprogram ourselves. So connection is vital. Yes. We are humans. No human is meant to feel alone. It doesn't mean that we are alone. There may be people around us. We feel alone. Mm-hmm. So what happened when you told your brother and your sister-in-law about your attempt? My, my sister-in-law, the reason the subject came up was she was leading suicide prevention workshops. And so she's talking about this and we were having a few drinks in the backyard. It was a beautiful summer night in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And I decided it was time to tell somebody. And so I told them and she was shocked and my brother didn't know what to say. And even my husband at the time didn't know, had no idea. And she started, you know, trying to talk with me about it. And she said, how do you feel about it now? Well, I was just numb. I was just Mm -hmm. completely numb to it. And it was through my own healing journey that, of course, that came up. Of course, I needed to heal that part of my life. But it's often that we carry these, like you said, carry these things around with us for so long. I thought I was fine. It was done. And it was very strange. I went to school the next day and people would say, you don't look very good. Oh, yeah, I'm fine. You know, and, and I, I did. I said, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Mm-hmm. I'm just carry on like normal. Yeah. Crazy. And then the second time later, when you were thinking about driving off a cliff, what was what was that situation? What was going on then? Still feeling alone or, or was it something else? Uh, I was at that time, I was feeling absolutely helpless mm-hmm. in resolving my situation. I was married. Um, my My first husband was quite emotionally abusive. And I realize now with all the information we have on covert narcissism, you know, he was a covert Mm -hmm. narcissist and that wasn't recognized back then. There was, I mean, it wasn't the help. I think you can see by my wrinkles, I've, I've been around on this planet for a while. And I, I was just lost and angry. So lost, so lost and beyond alone. Uh, And then, and, and I was, I was picking up speed. I remember driving over the mountain on this mountain in Victoria. And I thought of my two kids. And that was the end of that thought. That was the end of that thought. And I thought, oh gosh, no, they need me. They need me. And they need me without him. They need me without him. And so I need to take some steps. I need to get really serious about leaving him because this isn't fair to fair to them. And so it wasn't after that, you know, I I did get the help I needed and, and I did leave him. Good. Good. Yeah. That's an awesome insight to have. Like not just, oh, I can't leave my kids on their own, but oh no, like I, there's more to this situation in order to be there for them and be the best person that I can be for them. I need to, you know, do, do this other hard thing. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Awesome. And then What was, what was your healing journey like after that? Oh my gosh. Well, it really started after I left him and I had, I guess I'll, I'm just bearing all here. My, my brother who had taken his life, I was on a beach with a friend. She was doing kinesiology on me and I was living on Vancouver Island at the time. We're waiting for the tide to go out so we could pick oysters. So she said, well, why don't I, while we're waiting, why don't, why don't you let me practice this kinesiology on you that I'm, I'm learning? And it's, it was spiritual kinesiology, not just like yeah. what chiropractors do. So she's doing all this work and she would bring up, you know, she would clear things. Oh, it's your aunt. There's uh, something around this and she's clearing it and she's going on and on. 
I don't, I don't even think she knew I had a deceased brother. We were, you know, we were friends, but we weren't close and we weren't friends for all that long. Anyway, oh, she might have known, I don't remember, but she says, it's your brother. And then she said, he's here. And I said, I know. And before she said that, there was this white, bright white ball of light, like the size of a basketball, so brilliant light. And it was the most profound love I'd ever felt by far. It was just this incredible love in this light. And I met two other people that had the same experience in their lives. Um, so it validated it for me. But anyway, and she said, he's here. And I said, I know. And what we discovered was that he was bipolar and never diagnosed. Oh, that'll she, do it. She never channeled a spirit before, but he just wanted to speak to me. And he, he came through her. And the long and the short of it was his message to me was to start meditating. Interesting. Yeah. And I thought, wow, wow. And I thought at first that I, I was like, this whole spirituality thing is amazing because eventually I could feel his presence over the weekend and she continued to channel him. I mean, it was so he stuck wild. around for a long time. Yeah, it was so <laughs> wild, for both of us. And so when and that was an August long weekend. And when I got back into the city after the weekend, I started looking at meditation places. And so I started phoning. And they would say, so why do you want to meditate? Oh, to speak with my deceased brother. I thought, oh, these spiritual people, you know, and, and they're like, oh, we don't have that kind of meditation. So after three calls, I was kind of like, hmm, all right, what is this all about? You know, I was pretty young then. I was pretty young. So then I went, I had to go to this appointment. I'm in this building and I, I walked past a door and on the door, there was assigned meditation classes starting the following evening. I thought, hmm. So I'll. I'll write the number down. You know, we didn't have cell phones back then. Right. To take a bit. None of that existed. So I wrote the number down and called and registered and I showed up. And that was the beginning of my spiritual journey. And it took me eight months of meditating every day before I felt anything at all. When I did have a slight shift in my experience, it lasted about 10 or 20 seconds, you know. But he told me to. So I I just had the trust and faith that yeah. something was going to happen. And then it was not long after that, I discovered the full breath through meditation. And then I just started healing. Then stuff started coming up. And I, I learned how to heal myself. And so later studied all kinds of different modalities, spiritual modalities, healing modalities, you know, it's been 30 years of training and practice. Mm -hmm. And here we are today. And so if it weren't for him, I, I don't know, you know, if the universe wanted me to get on a spiritual path, maybe I would have found a different way. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. But that's how that started. That's fascinating. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that's really cool. Um, what what advice would you have for for other people who are in the darkness and feeling alone? What I would say today, if it's hard to connect with other people, to know that God, the universe source, is always loving you. And you can even imagine making yourself porous that you can let that love in. You're always being held. You're always, always, always being held. And if you can experience that or even know of a deceased loved one, like a grandparent or someone that's moved on, that you can call them in. If you don't have anyone in the physical, like if it's impossible for you to connect. So, of course, always reach out to others. Always mm -hmm. talk, you know, be vulnerable, talk. If that can't happen or isn't happening for you, you are always held. You're always, always loved. Always loved. Beautiful. Thank you. So how how have you fostered more connection in your life? Well, through my work, you know, I have I have very, very deep connection and really practice being vulnerable with others. You know, everything we put out comes back to us. So when we're vulnerable, 
with others when we tell someone how we're really feeling. And vulnerability can be sharing our biggest aspirations and dreams. Mm -hmm. It can be sharing our greatest fears. You know, there's the full spectrum. Mm -hmm. And so I practiced in my friendships and in, you know, my closest relationships being vulnerable and sharing. And it, it builds strength and it fosters connection. And also really, I, I get so much joy out of seeing the greatness in others, really seeing the greatness in others. And, and that's part of the healing and empowerment, you know, and even talking with my friends, my clients, people I might collaborate with, you know, my peers, people in the community. It's really finding the greatness in them. And everybody has their greatness. Everybody has something to offer. And when we're, if, if you know, ideation, if you can remember, it's temporary. And mm -hmm. there is something on the other side. It's always temporary. It's always temporary. Who can you reach out to? I mean, there's lots of hotlines, lots of hotlines out there. But I, I think it's feeling connection is, there's a connection with the self as mm -hmm. well, right? It's yeah. connected with yourself all the different parts of you yeah yeah there's a there's you know feeling feeling alone when there's nobody around you is one thing there's feeling alone when you're surrounded by people which is worse than feeling alone and being alone yeah but it's also feeling alone because we're not connected to ourselves you know we've lost ourselves somewhere along the way because of you know, stuff that's happened or whatever, whatever it is, we lose connection. Yeah. I'm trying to think of a different word, but just being who we are and feeling that even when there's nobody else out there, at least we have ourselves. And at some point, whether it's the depression or whatever else, we lose that somehow. Yes. And it's, if you think of the word, I agree. If you think of the word depress, to depress, is to kind of fall in on, on oneself. It's depressed, it's shrinking. And the opposite is impress, impress. So if you think of yourself as a being who can impress, impress yourself. Whoa, look what I got done today. That's amazing. I'm impressing myself. Depress is like you said, we lose ourselves. We're shrinking. We can't find it. We don't know where we are. We're depressed. After my brother came to me and I started meditating, I was on antidepressants and very, very strong antidepressants, the highest level. And I was able within a few months to go off my antidepressants and I never went back on. And my doctor was so concerned. He said, Cheryl, you're going to be on these the rest of your life. You were um, seriously depressed. You were severely, that was the diagnosis, severe depression. And I said, no. I want you just tell me the best way to go off. Do I wean myself off? Do I just stop cold turkey? Don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah. And and he said, well, the problem is when you go off, you might need a higher dose and that sort of thing. And anyway, I got off the antidepressants and he, as long as I lived in that city, every time I'd go and see him, he would do a questionnaire, a depression questionnaire with me and he would just shake his head. It's amazing. Huh. I've never seen anything like it. And it was, it was my own healing and empowerment, the meditation every day. So I've never stopped. I don't miss a day. It's been over 30 years. That's incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Especially coming from me who can't keep a routine to save her life. <laughs> I can't imagine doing anything every day for, for years. That's, yeah, amazing. But when you find something that you love and it, you know, it obviously it helps you feel better and, and all of that. And, and you had a really good reason to start, you know, and not, not give up. So it's important to stick with it sometimes, even when you don't want to. Well, it's not just, so mindfulness meditation would not do the same thing for me. The thing that I do differently in, in meditation is I breathe fully with the lower abdomen. So what happens when we get to a point of um, su you know, suicidal ideation, we have a lot of stuff in our subconscious. There's all kinds of wounds and traumas that are locked in the subconscious. And trauma is encoded in the right side of the brain. Trauma is not so much about what happened, but this lingering feeling of uncertainty of the self in the world. 
that carries on in life. That's the result of trauma. And so, and that gets worse as we age. It doesn't get better unless we do something about it. So remember I said to you in the beginning, I started doing, finding my own method of meditation. I started breathing. Mm -hmm. And the reason I did that, I learned when I was young to breathe fully in the really cold weather. And because I would shiver, I lived up in Alberta, minus 20, minus 30, and I would shiver. And I noticed. And so if I breathed really fully, I was afraid that my lungs would freeze. I was going to say, when you take deep breaths in the cold, you just end up coughing. No, no, I would, I would have my scarf and I would do nose breathing really long, deep breaths and my body would relax and I would stay warm. And so I use that. Yeah. I I discovered that that in mind. Very young. And then even when I was in junior high school, when we had to run laps around the track, I would use the really long full breath. I would have more endurance, I noticed. And so in the meditation, it just came to me because it was something I practiced occasionally. Mm -hmm. And so what happened because I was using that full breath when we engage the abdominal muscles, it changes the brain function. And and so when we're breathing normally right here, it's the medulla oblongata, the back part of the brain that's that's helping us breathe. When we engage the abdominal muscles, that breathing function goes to the frontal lobal brain and frees up the back of the brain, which helps us access the subconscious. Uh-huh. So when you breathe fully with your eyes closed and your focus in your body, eventually old stuck emotions are going to come up. And then, and that's what started happening for me. And when we have trauma, you know, when trauma is, it really is imprinted in the right side of the brain, we don't have linear memories. They're always Mm -hmm. fragmented. So I'd get these fragmented memories and feelings, and I just started breathing through them. And so that's what got rid of my depression was I was becoming my own energy worker and releasing these trapped emotions. So I didn't have the same triggers in life. That's amazing. Okay. That makes me want to try meditation. <laughs> I mean, which, which I, I do sometimes, but obviously not regularly because me and routines don't get along. Yeah. Okay. And I, I think that's, I think that's why just start, it's, it's a way of being for me. I process yes. everything. Well, in meditation that way. And, and as long as we keep growing, whatever got in the way before will come up for us, you know, when we take giant steps forward in our lives. And so that's part of the work I do with people is I teach them the meditations, how to become their own energy workers. And in the healing sessions, I'm just pulling all that energy out for them, with them. It really, you know, science has proven. And so it's very, very deep, lasting, profound healing. All right. Amazing. I love it when I learn new things, which, which I kind of do every time I talk to somebody here on the podcast, there's, and what I love is that, you know, two healing journeys are alike. We're all, everybody that I've talked to on this podcast and we're into year two now, like everybody's, well, reasons for hitting that rock bottom are different and everybody's reasons and the way that they move forward from that is different. And I think, you know, that's partly just because humans are all very unique individuals. But if you've tried a couple of things and it hasn't worked, try something else. Because what worked for one person doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Just keep exploring and keep an open mind. And yeah, you'll, you'll find your path and you'll find your way back to, to health and dare I say happiness. You mean dare say happiness. Yes, it does exist. It does. It does. It doesn't feel like it sometimes, but. No, that's true. But yeah, we, we do get there eventually when we, when we do the work, whatever that work looks like for us. That's right. Yes. Well, thank you so much for being here today, Cheryl, and sharing your story and your experiences and your vulnerability. I appreciate you. Thank you, Janet. And I'm I'm just so grateful that you have this podcast, you know, having been there myself. And uh, I just appreciate all the work that you're doing and who you are. You're a great woman. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for listening. 
remember that you are loved, you are worthy, you are valuable, you are meant for more, and that it really does get better. If you are in crisis, there are numbers that you can call or text to get the help that you need. That information for Canada and the U.S. is in the description below each episode. If you are in immediate crisis, please call 911. We love you, and I hope you'll listen again.